Hello, art historians. I'm back. Oops, sorry about that. I'm back with our next um, selection of artworks. And what we're looking at here, we're just going to do two artworks today. Um, we're going to do what is called the international style. Um, and it is a style of artwork that um, is a little bit more minimal. Um, it is less ornamented than our, our regular um, artwork, uh, I'm sorry, uh, buildings. Uh, international, um, we're looking at artwork, um, I keep saying artwork, we're looking at architecture that um, really is a major style in architecture um, in the 20s and 30s. Um, and you're looking at uh, really a, um, it, this is modernism. Um, so I have to make sure that you understand that, that modern doesn't mean like it happened right now when we're talking about art. Um, modern is, is a time period. Um, and we're looking at like from the 1920s to about the 19... 70s um, and and or 60s and then we're dealing with pop and then postmodern so like where people define modern art um, depends on who you're talking to but definitely the 20s to the 50s is modern art um, so what is the art called that we that is art of the time that we live in that's contemporary art that's the art of our time that's contemporary art are they going to eventually call our art of our time something else of course um, because that's that's how that works um, and so you're looking at an, an art style um, that was popular in Europe uh, became popular in America uh, it is um, the most commonly used art in in the English speaking world at that time period, um, and that includes even like places. Um, it really it really was the twenties and thirties all the way up to the seventies. Um, you know, it it had a good long run. Um, but what you're talking about is um, you're talking about um, lightweight materials. Um, you're talking about um, rejecting uh, ornamentation, so you know that that uh, frilly stuff at the top of the Carson uh, Peary Scott Company building that wouldn't be there. Um, you're looking at repetitive forms, um, you know, the, the repetition of the same form over and over again. Um, lots of flat surfaces. Uh, lots of glass. Um, what else do I need to talk about with? Oh, sorry. Um, I'm not ready to be there yet. Uh, you know, there are there people still building um, in the international style? Absolutely. Um, but it's, you know, it's heyday was really um, the 20s through the 70s. Um, there is a school of people that worked in Germany called um, the Bauhaus School. Um, and there were a bunch of people that were involved in that. And a lot of them sort of also became parts of um, this international style. And we're going to see um, a couple of really important guys in the international style. Um, we're going to see uh, Corbusier. We're going to see Mies van der Rohe. You're going to see all these names in a minute. Don't worry about it. Um, you know, the international style, it, um, it, it really is about uh, making sure that things feel more technological. Uh, remember, we're in the 20s now, and so we're looking at things being like this idea of, um, you know, there, there's lots of ideas of things being technologically driven machines and cars and airplanes and you know stuff like that and so um it, it really is about um yeah absolutely just being more simplified absolutely simplified um and and even in your materials okay so that's international style um so let's talk about what our first building okay let's let's look at our first little guy here 
here we go. This is Villa Savoy. It's the name of the house um, in uh, poissy sur um, uh, which is in France. Uh, it's in northern France um, by Le Corbusier. That's just, that's the name he goes by, Le Corbusier. Um, it was constructed in 1929, and we're looking at steel and then a new um, invention, reinforced steel. Um, so like rebar, um, in, like so metal posts inside um, the steel to allow it to be more, um, I'm sorry, reinforced concrete. I'm talking about reinforced steel, and that is supposed to say reinforced concrete. So give me one second, and I'm going to just change that. I've used this 9 million times, I, and I said steel because it was there. Reinforced concrete, and what do I mean by that? Um, I'm sure you've heard of, sorry about that, we're practicing bells today. <laughs> Reinforced concrete, we're looking at the idea of inside the concrete there being metal steel rods that function as sort of like a, a like a skeleton inside the concrete that keeps the concrete more stable. Remember the ancient Romans just built a wooden form and poured it in there? Well, with the new um, kind of reinforced concrete, we're looking at, um, you know, we're definitely looking at uh, a stronger, sturdier concrete. Um, we're looking at something that is, you know, a little more um, stable. So when I say to you the, you know, the, the, the ideas of the international style, um, lighter materials, um, so the, the use of this reinforced concrete and steel allows them to do a lot of things with it. Lots of glass, you can see um, these beautiful, uh, they're called ribbon windows, we'll talk about that in a second. These beautiful steel um, uh, pillars here um, that allow for part of the house to be up in the air, that allows for a very open space underneath. Um, rejecting ornamentation, look how sleek the lines are, look how simple the lines are. Uh, flat surfaces, look how flat the line is, lots of glass. So really we're, we're looking at a really excellent example of international style. So when we're talking about that, let's talk about Le Corbusier a little bit. Um, Corbusier considered like what life was looking like for the modern person now that there was electricity and there was, you know, all of these other important things, um, life changed with their refrigerators and all these crazy things that allow life to be a little easier and a little different or a lot different from how life had been lived before. Um, and he believed that architecture had a role in, in adapting to what he saw as the new machine age. Um, and he was a key believer in the idea that form, what it looks like, has to meet up with its function. But he also believed that houses, the function of a house, um, changed with this modern age. Um, he was a big fan of race cars and airplanes and factories. Um, he liked things that were efficient. Um, and so in looking at this, um, what you kind of get the idea of is um, one of the most important lines Corbusier ever said was, the house should be a machine for living in. And so that is what you see here with Villa Savoy. It is, it, it, the beauty in it, um, it is that it, it meets up with the new way of living. Um, he believed that beauty uh, is present in the modern and the ancient, but they come from the same sort of place. Um, which is a, a, like a simplicity. Uh, he believed that um, because we were working all the time in factories or offices and things like that, um, that your leisure time should be spent outdoors. So he includes a whole bunch of um, integrated indoor and outdoor spaces. Uh, he in used a ton of light so that if the weather prevented you from being outside, you, there's so much light that it felt like you were outside. Um, 
the inside is big and open. Um, it's what we call now an open floor plan. Um, and so you're looking at, this is a house, it's three bedrooms with a servant quarter. Um, and the main part of the house is, you know, like I said, lifting up on those, um, those freestanding posts. It's very streamlined, very sleek, very manufacturable, you know, manufactured space. Okay. And we get into, um, oh, it's not on here. Hold on. Okay. We get into the idea that um, he had five major points of his construction. Um, he believed that five points of architecture were one, there should be columns. Two, there should be terraces. Okay. So things on the roof where you could go out and be in the outside. Three, there should be an open floor plan or a free floor plan. It's free interior plan where it's just sort of open space. Four, he believed that the facade of the building needed to be simple, plain. Um, and five, he believed that there needed to be long expanses of windows, okay? Long expanses of horizontal, horizontal windows. Um, so when you look at this, you see, look at these beautiful stairs. This is one of Villa Savoy's most famous features. It's this beautiful concrete um, stairwell, but it's reinforced concrete. It has that steel rebar inside of it um, and then the concrete on the outside. So it looks smooth, even though it's like really sturdy. Um, and you can see, I'll show you in a minute, but here's those big windows. Here's those columns. I'm going to show you the terraces in a second. Okay. Here's that again. Um, it, here's your ramp right? Here's your, your outdoor uh, space um, and then your ramp. And then look at all of these open spaces for being upstairs. Okay. Look at this. Got your ramp to come in from that, come outside from the inside of the house, come up this ramp and up that ramp up to the rooftop garden. Okay. Uh, I think I have a picture. I don't have a picture, but you can see how it's pretty open except where the walls are necessary. But here's your ramps right? So look how cool this is. A terrace built into the part. Here's your living room, bathroom, driveway, bedroom, bedroom, okay, private sitting room. But look at hanging garden. So this, the garden, the hanging garden hangs over top of this little area here. So it's really about having um, open spaces. It's really about being able to have a lot of free and open space on the inside um, and for it to be Minimal, 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 minimal. Like that is really the word with international style. Like minimalism. Don't want ornamentation. Don't want it to be too wild. Okay. Then we're going to get into the next building, uh, which is in New York City um, and has a whole lot of information about it. That's why we're only doing two buildings today um, because we really want to talk about um, this guy. So this is the Seagram building. It is in Manhattan. Um, and, um, you can walk into the, uh, the, um, the lobby. There's a parking garage underneath it. That is a really cool place to park. If you need a place in downtown Manhattan to park, um, if you want to do a, you know, sort of a day, um, in New York, it's a really good place to park. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about this. Let's um, let's talk about who we see. New York City, USA. Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. Um, so usually when you hear about him, people just say van der Rohe. Um, uh, and the other architect is Philip Johnson. Okay. Uh, and they are both super crazy, super important. Um, so this is a steel frame with a glass curtain wall and bronze. I'm going to explain what a glass curtain wall is in a few minutes. But first, we have to have story time. Okay? It's, you know, story time is important. All right. So in 1932, Philip Johnson opened um, an exhibit called Modern Architecture, the International Exhibition at the MoMA, the Metropolitan Museum of Modern Art, which had just recently opened. I think it opened in 31. Okay. So in 32, he sets the International Exhibition of Modern Architecture. In 32, Philip Johnson also published a book called International Style, which is considered to be the most influential book ever to come out ever, ever, ever about 
um, architecture. Uh, and I can tell you that my nephew, who wa was an architecture student, um, this that was one of the books he was required to buy. Okay. Um, the book impacted, and remember, this came out in 1932. The book impacted architecture around the world for at least the next 30 years, at least, probably longer than that, because people are still building some of this. Um, he was influenced, Philip Johnson was influenced by Mies van der Rohe, this guy, Le Corbusier, who we just saw, and Walter Gropius, who I was telling you before, was a member of the, the Bauhaus movement, that, which is, again, the German version of sort of the sleek modern lines. Um, Johnson was a, a big deal. Uh, he was on the cutting edge since the 1920s. Um, he was, you know, uh, he, like, he was just, um, like, he was important, and Van der Rohe was important. Um, and so we have this company, Seagram, okay? Canadian Liquor Company. More bells. Okay. Canadian Liquor Company, Seagram. And what they want to do is they want to uh, set up a home base in the United States. And they want to set that up in Manhattan. And they need a big building to do that because uh, they want to move their, their head of operations to New York. Um, and they made a ton of money. The, the Seagrams made a ton of money during prohibition. So they just have all this money, right? Because alcohol was legal in Canada, but not legal in the United States. So he, they made a ton of money. So the Lever building um, is right near here. And, and it, um, it was one of like the first big modern buildings on Park Avenue. And, and the Seagram family really liked it. Um, and it was the first one with a curtain wall in Manhattan. And I'm going to talk to you about that in a minute. And um, so Charles Luckman used to work at Lever that has this really cool, um, you know, curtain wall, glass, modern. And he leaves um, Lever and um, he is hired uh, to do some work for, for Seagram. And the CEO of Seagram uh, hates uh, Charles Luckman. Well, not the CEO, the CEO's daughter. The CEO's daughter was at Harvard at the School of Architecture. Now, like this is 1950s and she's at, like, she's at Harvard. And she says to her father, dad, you cannot hire this guy, Luckman. This is, this is a terrible idea, it's terrible. He's awful, right? You, you can't, you can't, no. Um, you have to hire someone else. And her father's like, no, I, I, I signed up to, to work with Luckman. He did that lever building. And she said, yeah, but we want a bigger, better building. And he's not capable of doing what you want him to do. You, you can't hire him. So on her daughter's advice, um, he, the CEO of Seagram fires Luckman. And his daughter, the CEO of Seagram, his name is like Bromfman or something like that. Um, the daughter takes Bronfman to the MoMA, Metropolitan Museum of Modern Art, and says, look, look at this architecture stuff. Now, remember, some of Johnson's stuff is still in an exhibit, like a temporary, like some stuff was in that temporary exhibit, but now there's stuff, longer stuff in, in the, you know, more permanent exhibit. And in the more permanent exhibit, there is stuff by Frank Lloyd Wright. There's stuff by Le Corbusier, who just did Villa Savoy. Um, she walks him to the MoMA and she says, look. Here, here, here are some of your choices. If you want a really beautiful building in Manhattan that people will stop and stare at, you've basically got three choices, Dad. Choice number one, Le Corbusier. And then she says to him, and he's um, difficult to work with, he's a pain in the butt, and he's just not worth it. So you can't do Le Corbusier, done. Choice two, Frank Lloyd Wright. But by this point, Frank Lloyd Wright was already 90. Um, and we haven't done Lloyd Wright, we will in a minute. Um, Frank Lloyd Wright was already 90 by this point. And she's like, he's too old. He's going to die halfway through. And then where will we be? Um, choice four. I'm sorry, choice three. Mies van der Rohe. Look, look at van der Rohe. And if you get Mies van der Rohe, you also get Philip Johnson, who's amazing. And she said, Dad, that's your only choice. So I told you there were three choices, but really there's only one. You've got to have Mies van der Rohe and Philip Johnson. 
And that's what he did. Uh, his daughter was a, a, you know, a study, a student of architecture. Um, he trusted her. And so they fired um, Charles Luckman and they hired Mies van der Rohe and Philip Johnson. And um, they get this building, which is called the Seagram Building. And What's interesting is you're looking at a steel frame because, of course, you cannot build this tall without a steel frame. We've talked about that with a glass curtain wall. I'm going to talk about what a curtain wall is in a minute and bronze, like ancient bronze, bronze, like bronze, real bronze, um, not bronze color, bronze. But when you're looking at that, it it's beautiful, like it's ancient materials, right? Bronze, but it looks super modern, but it has this minimalist front that is timeless, will never go out of style. It's this idea of less is more. Um, the bronze, what's cool about the bronze is when you use bronze um, and it's outside, bronze has a patina to it. It will change color. It might get a little green. It might get a if you don't do stuff with it. Um, and so like it would naturally darken over time. Um, but as it does its slight darkening, it has a beautiful like depth to the color. And so that's why Van der Rohe and Johnson picked bronze. But what that means that is that literally somebody's job every year, it's not somebody, but a team of people every year go out and oil the bronze. Um, to keep it from oxidizing. Uh, so they, they get out there and they treat the bronze to make sure that it has that beautiful, caramelly, root beery, beautiful color instead of turning like that greenish red that we saw on the seated boxer. Mies van der Rohe loved Greek architecture, loved, loved, loved Greek architecture. And you can see that in here in a minute when we go inside. But you can also see before we see all of like when we're looking at the outside, look at the symmetry, look at the like classical proportions. It doesn't feel like it's too tall. It doesn't feel like it's too wide. It doesn't feel like the windows are out of proportion with the building. Um, it, it's idea. His idea was to, to use classical influence and, and this is a quote from him, is to distill the lessons of the ancient Greeks in materials that are metal and glass. Take the lessons from the ancient Greeks and apply them to our modern materials. And so that's why we have these beautiful clean lines. That's why we have these beautiful mullions. I'm gonna talk about what a mullion is in a minute. That's why we have this beautiful reflectiveness. Um, it, it, is, it is really stunning, okay? Before we do anything, about the sort of the insides of this building. I want you to realize that this is the building, but this area here, this is the corner. Okay, see where that tree is and where those cars are? That's the corner. This empty area in front is taken up by two fountains because he, Van der Rohe and Johnson believed that if they brought the building all the way out to the edge of their uh, their plot of land, and they could have done that, the building would have felt suffocating. Um, they chose to give up this big open space in the center so that it could act as um, a piazza, a, a plaza, a, a place for gathering. And it is a place for gathering. Um, the, the edges of the fountain are raised. You can sit on them. People sit there and eat their lunches. Um, the fountains are decorated every Christmas with really cute Christmas decorations. Um, it is an open space. It's also, by not bringing it all the way out to the street, it keeps it from feeling like you're in a canyon, right? And the third thing is right across the street from this building is one of the older buildings in New York City. Um, that is the, um, here, let me, let me, let me, this is right across the street. And so what we're doing is we're standing at the door to um, the Seagram building, looking across the street. And across the street is um, the tennis club. Um, and it is this old, beautiful, um, Italian innate, palazzo, like a palace. Um, and he realized that if he took the building out to this far edge, it would, it would drown this building. 
Um, and remember, this is a guy that loved Greek and Roman architecture. Look at all of these columns and arches, and this is what he loves. And so there's no way he is going to build something that will then suffocate this building across the street. And so what he does when he builds his building is he has this palazzo, right, that big open space, and he has columns. There are some columns. And then the whole inside of the lobby is covered in Roman travertine marble, the same kind of marble roughly that is on this building. So he takes into consideration the building across the street. He takes that into consideration when he builds how far out he's going to go. He takes it into consideration when he builds this open plan at the bottom. These are the elevator banks, one, two, three elevator banks. And the whole elevator bank is completely covered in um, marble. And then you'll see that the elevator bank is very small and it, um, it has like a cornice that sticks out and then the building is built on these beautiful tall columns, okay? Now, let's talk about some other language that I used. Mullions. Mullions are these lines on windows. And these mullions give you, this is so great, an uninterrupted line from the very first beginning of the mullion all the way up to the top of the, oops, sorry, all the way up to the top of the building. Okay, so these are called mullions, those big long lines. And those uninterrupted mullions give you this wonderful sense of height and proportion. Um, because they're uninterrupted, they give some decoration. By the way, they are completely decorative. They're, they do not function at all in any kind of like construction purpose. There is not a need for them. They don't have to be there. But what it does is it gives it that line that brings your eye up. Um, it gives you these wonderful ideas of depth and shadow because as the sun moves, you get shadow on some of the windows and some of not the windows. And then because the outside is bronze, they went with these slightly yellowed windows that keep the sun from coming in too brightly and being really um, annoying. Uh, and so, uh, you know, here we go back to our, um, let me go, here's, there's that really beautiful fountain here, these fountains that sit here, this big open area, the windows, and then you can see, see the columns? Those are those steel beams, okay? That it's, you can see it here, you can see it here. This is the steel skeleton of the building. So let's go to the floor. Oh no, floor plan, floor plan. So you can see here are, this is the plaza out front, fountain, fountain. Okay. And then you can see the, the, the big um, pillars, the big steel columns that are the base of the building. And so you can see that the front is even a little smaller than the back, right? It comes out. But each of these big squares is one of the big giant steel beams that is, um, uh, that is the skeleton of the building. So what is a, a curtain wall? Um, so a curtain wall is, and I don't know um, why I don't have a picture of it. I did have one, but um, I think when we transferred everything over to uh, Google Slides, it didn't quite come in right. A curtain wall is a, I'm, now since it's not here, I'm going to do something I never do, which is I'm going to go over here and I'm going to type in curtain wall system. And I want you to see how they build these buildings. Okay. So go to images. Let me get a good one here. All right. So you build with your big steel beams, right? And then your outside of your building, the glass part of your building, just here we go. Here's a good one. Just gets set onto, so you have your big steel pillars, then you have sort of like this internal grid system, and then you just, here we go. So here's our big pillars, then here we have this grid system, and literally this wall of windows literally just clamps on here. Um, and so that's why it's called a curtain wall. It is, it's all of the windows, um, but they are, um, they are put in, um, 
in groups. It's not like you're putting in a single window. Um, and it's not like you have to worry about finishing the inside before you do the outside or anything like that, because they're literally just added on to the outside. Um, it's very cool. It's a really interesting technique. Um, and um, when you when you install them, uh, it allows for um, let's see what I'll, I'm going to go to. Yeah, I'm going to go to the dreaded Wikipedia. Um, when we do that, you can see that they can just put in whole sections of windows at once. That is really important when you're doing construction in a large, uh, here we go, when you're doing construction in a large section, because when you build a glass curtain wall, you just can just bring in big chunks and hang it there. Um, and then they're, you know, drilled in, but they can be drilled in. Um, and then your whole outside of your, your building is done. And so this was the vision um, of Mies van der Rohe and Philip Johnson was to give a, a, a view um, that was beautiful, to make it look like a plaza or a piazza, to sort of seamlessly integrate with materials and color with the tennis club across the street. Um, to not use every single bit of the space uh, there, but to use the space um, carefully so that, um, so that it looked uh, like it was proportionate. Um, to use those mullions and the pillars at the front to echo um, the columns of, of classical architecture uh, and to <clears throat> build a building that is minimalist without being ugly. Um, and uh, that is what he does here. Um, he being Mies van der Rohe, I should say they, um, because also Philip Johnson. But this is the, this is the international style. And, and this is, I think, one of the best examples of it um, in, in its ability to know where it's being built its ability to blend in with its um, with its surroundings, with the the thought that even though we could come all the way out to this sidewalk, we're not going to do that because that's not what is needed right here on on this space, um, and to really make something that I mean, look how old that looks, right? But it goes with this, which is very new. Um, and and they're beautiful together. If you ever have the opportunity to go and see them, I highly recommend it that you just, even if you just drive by the Seagram building, it's beautiful. Um, and so that's international style. Um, next time we're doing a whole bunch of different things, um, but I wanted to get, you know, our, our couple of our big buildings in here um, and I'll see you again next time. Uh, have a good day and see you soon.